This clip will go through the derivation and a discussion of the idea of generalized least squares or GLS. We'll start out with a model, just a very standard regression model written in matrix form and I'll assume you have a brown belt in terms of matrix algebra. Y is equal to x times beta plus u and here are the dimensions we're having n observations and k explanatory variables so x is an n by k matrix. We assume that the error term u is uh, zero mean and has a variance omega but now importantly that omega is unequal to sigma squared times the identity matrix so we're dealing with the situation where we have heteroscedasticity. That's very important. Of course we know that for this situation the OLS estimator can be written like this beta hat equals x prime x inverse x prime y. Okay, so this is the formula you should know in your sleep. And you will also know that the variance if we have heteroscedasticity for this beta hat is this x prime x inverse x prime omega x x prime x inverse. And we know that the beta hat is unbiased but it is not efficient. So it's not a blue estimator doesn't have the smallest possible variance. The question we are dealing with here now is the question of whether there is an efficient estimator for beta. We know the OLS estimator it is not. In general the answer is yes uh, and in fact an emphatic yes in principle. So but let's think of what we need to get there. What we want is some sort of transformed version of model one and this transformation has to achieve two things a as we still want to estimate beta it should retain beta as a linear parameter vector okay, so it shouldn't change anything about beta because we are interested in beta and b it should deliver deliver some sort of new error term for the regression model where the error term actually does meet the Gauss-Markov assumptions and that of course includes the homoscedasticity assumption and if we have achieved this then we would have a model where basically we can apply OLS to and still get an estimator for beta. We'll, we'll see how that works later and how we get there. So before we continue with this train of thought we need to extend our mathematical toolbox a little bit and we'll have to think a little bit about this error term in particular about the variance covariance matrix for this error term which we called omega. So let's see omega. It will be an n by n matrix and on the diagonal it will have the variances sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared and so forth for all the error terms and we will assume that the error terms are non-autocorrelated with each other so we have zeros everywhere else. Now this is a symmetric and positive definite matrix. So let me just abbreviate that with uh, SPD. So it's important that you understand the structure of this omega in the case of heteroscedasticity. So we have different variances on the diagonal. Now, for every symmetric and positive definite mat matrix omega, there is another matrix equally n by n, same dimension as omega, and we shall call that other matrix P, for which the following is valid omega equals p times p prime. In some sense this is like taking a square root or p is some sort of square root matrix. Now we can just uh, pre and post multiply with p inverse and then we get this result. p inverse omega p prime inverse should be equal to the identity matrix. Now here it's pretty obvious what p should be. It should just be the individual standard deviations sigma 1 because then you can think about if we multiply p with p prime of course for this case p prime is going to be the same as p if we multiply 
at p with p prime, we get sigma 1 squared and then sigma 2 squared on the second diagonal element. So that's trivially true if you understand the structure of omega here. So how does that help? Well, let's think about this. We really want an, some sort of new error term which meets the Gauss-Markov assumption. So let's start another node. Let's call it node B. And I propose something. Let's consider we calculate a new term V which is equal to P inverse times U. So that matrix P inverse times our original error term. So let's think about the properties of this. The expected value of P inverse U is still going to be zero because the expected value of u is zero. What about the variance? The variance of p inverse u is going to be p inverse times the variance of u times p prime inverse. That's just the general rule for uh, variance calculations with matrices and the variance of u is just omega. Now of course from node A we know that p inverse times omega times p prime inverse is just the identity matrix. Now why is that important? Well the identity matrix has a value of 1 on the diagonal and that trivially represents a homoscedastic variance covariance matrix. So that error term V would be a fantastic error term to have in a regression because it would meet the Gauss-Markov assumption. It has constant variances, in fact variances of 1. The 1 is necessarily but it's constant, that's important. So if that trick of pre-multiplying U with P inverse to get V worked so well, let's transform our regression model in equation 1 in the same manner. So let's pre-multiply model 1 with p inverse. So we are not changing the equation, we're just pre-multiplying both sides and this is what we get. Of course on the right hand side we have p inverse x times beta plus this term p inverse u, that's of course which is called v. And let's call that model 2 still the same model really. Let's call these two terms, give them new names, x tilde and y tilde. And then we can rewrite our model like this, x tilde equals beta tilde times beta plus v. Now this is great because now you can see beta is still our linear parameter vector. So that model 2 certainly meets part A of what we need to achieve and it has error term V which we already demonstrated meets the second part of our requirements, part B. So in some sense this seems to be a, a stroke of genius, this pre-multiply with P inverse. So let's try and understand what that Y tilde and the X tilde are. So P inverse is 1 over sigma 1, 1 over sigma 2 and so forth on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else times our y vector y1 to yn and if you do that matrix multiplication what you get is y1 over sigma 1, y2 over sigma 2 all the way to yn over sigma n. What about x tilde? So x tilde is p inverse times x. Now what's x? Let's assume we just have a constant and one explanatory variable x1 to xn. And then we will get 1 over sigma 1, 1 over sigma 2, all the way to 1 over sigma n. And the second column x1 over sigma 1, x2 over sigma 2, all the way to xn over sigma n. So if you look at this y tilde and x tilde, really what these are are just weighted versions of y and x themselves. So... Why has this been useful? Really it's been useful because model 2 is really quite a nice model. It meets the Gauss-Markov assumptions and it has our parameter beta we are interested in. So let's just apply OLS to model 2. And what we get will be a PLU estimator for beta. But really we are thinking of the beta in model 1. We are really still interested in model 1 and the beta with its interpretation in model 1. So we call this beta hat GLS or the GLS estimator for beta. What does it mean when I say apply OLS to 2? Well, 
we'll just calculate x tilde prime x tilde inverse x tilde prime y tilde. So this is just our OLS formula just with x tilde and y tilde instead of x and y. Now of course we know the definitions for x tilde and y tilde and if you plug these definitions in and you remember how to use primes in terms of matrix multiplications you get this uh, rather complicated looking term. It becomes a little bit easier if you realize that you can replace the, the middle terms of p prime inverse times p inverse that is just exactly the same as omega inverse and we have that twice here and that follows from node a okay so we have the gls estimator for beta beta gls is x prime omega inverse x inverse x prime omega y so let's think about the properties of this the expected value for beta hat gls what is that you will perhaps remember that what we need to do to figure that out is replace in equation 3 the y with the model. And we'll find out that the expectation is going to be beta. So what we need to do is we need to substitute our model 1 into that equation 3. So we replace y with x beta plus u. And then you can use your assumptions and get that result. What about the variance of GLS? of the GLS estimator. It uses the same starting point. Our definition for beta hat GLS, so x prime omega inverse x inverse x prime omega. And now instead of y, we use the term from, so y is going to be replaced with x beta plus u. And where did that come from? That came from so that x beta plus u, that's of course nothing else but y, and we know that from our model 1. So we substituted equation 1 into equation 3. So now you can do a little bit of algebra, very much like in the OLS estimator case to derive the variance. And what you will get is that the variance for beta hat GLS is x prime omega inverse x and the inverse of that entire term. So we'll find an unbiased estimator and we also know it's a blue estimator, so it's an efficient estimator. What does that mean? That means that this variance equation for beta hat GLS is smaller in a matrix sense. What that means, I'll leave that open, okay? But in a matrix sense, that variance is smaller than the variance for the OLS estimator, which we know to be inefficient. And that variance was of course just this definition here. Um, so x prime x inverse, x prime omega x, x prime x inverse. So GLS delivers an efficient estimator, meaning that the variance for beta hat GLS is smaller than the OLS variance. This is all nice and well so far. Of course, in practice, to implement, implement such an estimator, we need the omega. We don't know the omega. It's a variance covariance matrix of the unknown error terms u. So in practice, in order to implement a GLS estimator, what you need is an estimate for that omega or an estimate for the p. There are different strategies to get such an estimate. The most straightforward one is to use what's called weighted least squares, where we proxy the variance of the error terms of a particular variable, or you can use generalized feasible least squares where you, in some other way, get an estimate for the individual variances. But that is not for this clipper.